everybody. We'd like to welcome you to this special presentation uh, this afternoon here in the United States uh, with our great friends and partners in Greece, the Banaki Museum. Uh, we are obviously introducing NHS Talks uh, webinars and stories uh, in a collaboration with the National Hellenic Museum in Chicago. And certainly the focus of this year for all of us uh, Greeks all across the world has been the 200th anniversary of independence. And with no uh, shortage or delay, we have a great presentation for you this afternoon. Uh, and I'd like to turn it over to George Mandinis of the Banaki Museum to begin our presentation. Uh, we will, again, as we always do, uh, be available for questions. Uh, we will monitor both Facebook and uh, here on Zoom to let you know um, any questions that we may follow up at the end. So George, I'm going to turn it over to you. We're excited to hear about uh, obviously Greece and reopening and, and, and what that's meant for the Banaki and of course your your wonderful uh, exhibit uh, that uh, hopefully a lot of us coming over to Greece uh, will we'll make sure we stop in and visit. Thank you very much, Drake. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. It's evening here in Athens. And um, I, as you probably know, uh, Greece is slowly opening up, actually in some areas very quickly opening up. Museums have been open for a month now, and with that opening, the opening of the great exhibition which we prepared at the Benaki to celebrate the bicentenary of the beginning of the Greek Revolution. The exhibition is called 1821, Before and After, uh, as you can see on the cover of the monumental catalogue which we produced. And tonight I have the pleasure of introducing the two curators of the exhibition, Dr. Stasos Akelaropoulos and Maria Dimitriadou. They are both colleagues at the museum, they're working at the historical archives of the Benaki, and they started work on this show five years ago. It is probably the most ambitious exhibition we have ever undertaken and the largest and most important show on modern Greece. And the view they took was one of uh, the, long, the bigger picture, the longer duration. So they will explain why the show is called 1821 before and after. They will explain why it takes up an enormous building, Pireos 138, and they will take us hand by hand through the show as if we're there. And I take great pleasure in saying that instead of a PowerPoint show, which we usually do uh, for such a presentation, Tonight we're premiering, and it is the first time uh, that we're doing it, a 360 degrees video which kind of takes you in the show. It's interactive. Uh, uh, when it goes live, you will be able to see it, you will be able to hear the curators narrate, but you will be able to turn your gaze whichever way you want to see, as if you were there. And we're trying tonight a hybrid version. So we will use the video, but you will have live commentary by the curators themselves. Now, such an undertaking has teething problems, which means that we will have to make sure that the proper screen share happens because there are three different videos and there is a constant flow. We have rehearsed that, but if there are any problems, I beg for your forgiveness. We'll do our best to give you a smooth experience of the show. And just to help, I will be disappearing from the screen every now and then, popping to the office next door where my colleagues are doing the presentation and coming back. So, you know, it is high tech, but not too high tech in this day and time. So, um, it's a great pleasure to be able to uh, do this presentation and to be with you. It's been a very hard year for everybody. And uh, tonight is our chance to celebrate with you all uh, the bicentenary of the Greek Revolution. Therefore, I pass 
uh, now uh, the microphone and the screen to my dear colleagues, Maria and Tassos, to take us through the exhibition 1821, before and after. Thank you. Thank you, Yoris. Thank you. Thank you, Yoris. Our exhibition is a journey through time. A selection of objects present 100 years of history, the first 100 years of modern Hellenism, beginning from 1770, and we're now 50 years before the revolution. The story of modern Hellenism begins with the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, and later in Crete in 1669 by the Ottomans. Constantinople, painted in 1794. The diaries and drawings of travelers from abroad persecute the Philelens, whose rich connect Greeks with the ancient past. The permits that make it is possible, the guilds that empower them, the tools of the merchants and the toys they bring back to their families. Merchant Greek communities establish branches and sub-branches of their trading houses in European commercial centers, cities and ports. They need to staff trading houses with young Greeks who are educated and qualified, promote systematic education. Education developed by getting inspiration from the European Enlightenment and advanced thanks to the increase of production of Greek books intended to lead for literary public, part of which was fascinated by the Europe and wanted to learn about history, read ancient Greek works, become familiar with geography and science, and overcome the obscurity versant with the ignorance. Adamandus Koraeus of Hios, a pivotal figure of, <coughs> of Greek education, is a bronze statue by Yanis Papas executed in 1939. The Orthodox Christian Church was dominant, dominant influence, functioning in a normative fashion, comforting the anxieties and fears of believers, reviving the hopes of everyday life with services and ch in churches and monasteries. Next, we get a flavor of the everyday life of Greeks in the pre-revolutionary period, what they look like, what they were, what kind of objects they use. Depending on the location and history of each part of Greeks, Greek world, its culture incorporates a variety of elements from respective rulers. Regions such as Ionian Islands, which never experienced Ottoman rule, preserve their own particular culture with powerful Western influences. The day life was difficult and financially constrained, but the popular culture they developed provided significant moral support. Music, singing, cooking, Baking expressed their experience and dreams. Gradually, a profound and natural communication with the culture of other communities often developed. This communication was inspired by the coexistence of people. It was a cultural exchange with trusting religion and dogmas and incorporated elements from the daily life of the empire's ethnic groups and nationalities, such as Turks, Jews, Armenians, and others. Maps of the era, the way of, of world depicted back then. The sword, of, the sword, the guns, the decades of disastrous wars between the Ottoman Empire and, the, and Russia, the Orlov Revolt of 1770, the last uprising before the Great Revolution. The revolt high, high tenant, tensions between conquered and conquered, and its bloody failure brought to an end a cycle of mostly local uprisings. Retaliation against the insurgents was harsh, particularly money and creed. Ali Pasha, a powerful Ottoman local ruler in his court, young Greeks learned both European diplomacy and warfare. Cleftes and Anatoly, the fabled fighters. Their activity and power will strengthen their efforts toward the revolution. Rigas Ferreos, whose words roused the spirit of self-determination among the people. Rigas Ferreos mobilized spiritually the Balkan people against the Ottoman conquerors. He was connected to Greek merchants, students, and printers of the Greek diaspora. He believed that through the wide circulation of his revolutionary writing and proclamation, he would be able to awaken the Greek ethnos and along with the other subject people of Balkans, of the Balkans. Finally, the Filiki Eteria. 
the secret society which built the underground network preparing the great revolution. It was a school teaching planning, conspiracy, as well as free thinking and courage for those who risk their lives to systematically prepare the steps to leading the revolutionary revolution. It began in 1814 to gradually form an extensive network of members based on strict conspiratorial rules. Members were initially sourced from the major diaspora community of Greek merchants and from Greek serving the Russian state apparatus and army. Subsequently, men at arms from Greek region, priests, members of the higher clergy, and notables, Procrity, joined the Italian. The Greek War of Independence begins in February 1821 when Greek armed forces clashed with the Ottoman army in Danubian principalities, today is Romania, and are crushed in battle. Despite this defeat in March 1821, the revolution begins in earnest in Rumeli, Central Greece, and Peloponnese. At the beginning of the war, there are numerous centers of revolutionary activity, including those regions where war is neither favored by the people nor by the geographical location, such as Thrace, Macedonia, Epirus, Thessaly, the islands of Eastern Aegean, the coast of Asia Minor, and Cyprus. It is in the Peloponnese, Rumeli, Crete, and the Aegean that the army and navy of the revolutionaries manage to keep war alive. The war was memorable moments of victory as well as several tragic disasters. Important successes include the fall of the Politza and the victory against the, regu the regular Ottoman army at Drevenakia, whereas in the, ex the extensive looting of massacres of civilian Christian population on the islands of Chios and Shara are examples of Greece's defeat. The national assemblies, the voting of the constitutions, and the institutional formation of the administration are the constituent acts of a nation Greek state. A great painting by Kostandinos Volanakis that belongs to the Angelakos family collection depicts the Greek battleship Aris from the island of Hydra at the moment of his heroic exodus from the Gulf of Navarre in 1825 during the attack of Ibrahim Pasha. Also from Angelakos' collection present the moment of the emblematic exodus of Mesolonghi in 1826. A very, a very rare French map of Greece that comes from a collection of Antonis Benakis indicates the boundaries of the two years later established Greek state. The war of independence gradually becomes more organized in character and the need to create administra administrative structures and institutions calls from the organization of the earliest form of government. An oil painting that belongs to Central Bank of Greece presents the landing of General Karaiskakis and his troops near Pere in, in Faliro, near Pereus, in 1826, a year and a half before the crucial sea battle of Navarino. Portraits of 1821. Heroes often stand as the very essence of a nation, its people and the particular place that each of us calls home. In Greece, the men and women who fought in our heart or had a role in the political organization of the war of independence, these people fought and sacrificed themselves for a cause that might easily have ended in failure. However, the successful outcome of the struggle became a launch pad for the creation of Greece and from in a, it emerged a pantheon of fighters and a gallery of heroes that have sparked the imagination for all ages and backgrounds. The role of Philippines in the Greek War of Independence was decisive. decisive. Their presence the side of, at, the side, at the side of Greek fighters combined both an interest and sensitivity of Europe and American societies to the national struggle of a Christian people with a long history and ancient past. Several Philippine soldiers participated in the war and many of them sacrificed themselves, their lives, for the freedom of the Greeks. Their military experience in the art of tactical warfare and the use of cavalry and artillery educated the, the revolutionaries in aspects of contemporary military practice. Their presence decisively assisted the dialogue between the Greeks, Europe, and America, and helped the, dis the dissemination of Philippine turning it from a mere 
into interest into flood of sympathy for the Greek effort for freedom. These steps would eventually lead to the, 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 the culmination of foreign support for the Greek war, the Battle of Naparino, the event that truly determined the fate of the war. The governorship of Ioannis Kapodistrias ran from January 1828, when he arrived in Athpion, until October 1831, when he was assassinated in the same city. It was a period filled with great expectation, yet based by many political impasses. Despite the Greek desire for their liberty, the consolidation of his new political power encountered substantial Difficulties not only internally, but also due to the conflict ambitions of the great power in the region. The governor of, his, of this newly born Greece seized power while, while people were still waiting for a king to be elected from the royal houses of Europe. For four years, despite adverse internal and external conditions, he tried to lobby with the great powers to expand Greek borders into certain Greece and Crete, and in the areas where Greeks were still fighting against the Ottomans. In August 1820, French troops under General Maison landed in Peloponnese, the Morea, to try to drive out the Ottoman army that still remained in Greece. Now we are in the ground floor of the Benaki Museum, and we present you uh, the exhibition regarding the king, the arrival, and uh, the reign of uh, King Otto. After the assassination of Capodistrias, the three great powers, United Kingdom, France, and Russia, offered the Greek throne to Prince Leopold of saxe coburg and Gotha, who ultimately declined the role. They then offered the crown to Prince Otto, the second son of King Ludwig I of Bavaria. This offer of the Greek crown to a prince from a German state of limited influence in the international scene posed no threat to the great powers guardianships of, Greek, of Greece. During the years 1833 until 1835, royal power was exercised by Bavarians due to juvenility of the newly elected king. The guardianship of the great powers and the Regency Council were connected to both the foreign and domestic policy of the country and offer operated outside the social and political realities of Greece. The destruction of the crops in the wake of the War of Independence created a recession which in, which in turn undermined the inception of the new kingdom, kingdom's economical life. The difficult economical situation of the state was compounded by the great difficulty of concluding any economical agreement, mostly in maritime trade. In addition to the establishment of the several primary of the establishment of several primary and secondary schools within the new state, the establishment of the Othonian University in Athens in 1837 raised great hopes for the improvements for improvements in education. The university ensured the prospect of studies in Greece and the gradual rise of social class of Greek scientists and scholars who would staff public and private institutions. In 1834, the capital of Greece was transferred to Athens from Nafplion, making grand connection between the new state and the antiquity in the eyes of both Europeans and Greeks. In the same year, the young king married the dynamic Amalia, Duchess of Oldenburg, in the interest, in the interest of consolidating the monarchy in Greece and enhancing its status, the construction of a palace, today is the seat of the Hellenic Parliament, begun in 1836 at the expense of Otto's father, King Ludwig I of Bavaria. The young queen had already enthusiastically adopted as her official court dress an ensemble created from elements of the urban dresses of Peloponnese and Attica. This move manifested her willingness to embrace local customs at the new court, was gradually being instituted among Fanariot descendants and figures of the War of Independence. The death of the leaders of the War of Independence created a 
created a juncture between the war as an actual historical event and the war as a symbol of national rebirth. Additionally, these deaths mark the starting point of the creation of the new state. From the mid-19th century onwards, the war became a constant, re constant reference in public discourse. During the second half of the 19th century, Greek painters tried to unite in their work the messages, the aims and the ideals of the war of independence with the future. They tried to turn the reverberations of the war into a framework to guide the development of a collective, me collective memory, education and public life in contemporary Greece. They sought to capture not only the distant as ancient Greek past, but also more recent subjects, such as the events and scenes of the war, the faces of the fighters and even its myths. Their aim was to turn the message of the war, the message of this national effort, into a unifying ideology. On 3rd of September 1843, military units in Athens, led by Colonel Dimitrios Kalergis, occupied Palace Square, today Syndagma Square, and started a revolution demanding the adoption of a constitutional regime in the country. Meanwhile, a large crowd roused by General Ioannis Makriyanis, who had fought in the War of Independence, joined the soldiers in their demands. In the final months of 1843, elections were held, resulting in the formation of a Constitutional National Assembly, which deliberated towards the proclamation of a constitution in March 1844 and defined constitutional monarchy as the country's form of a government. The term Megali, Megali idea is identified with Greek irredentism, the national ideology that prevailed between 1844 and 1922. It aimed to expand the country's borders in order to bring the thousands of Greeks who remained in Ottoman rule lands into the state, which had emerged with the declaration of Greek independence. Despite the introduction of constitutional monarchy and the holding of elections, political condition in the kingdom remained tense, mainly due to the despotic attitude of King Otto. Meanwhile, fiction between the representatives of the great powers and the king continued coming to a head during the Crimean War when Rosa attacked the Ottoman Empire when, while the United Kingdom and France sided with the Sultans. King Otto's close association with the Megali idea turned from a political advantage to a personal loss. He was unfavorable, unfavorably compared with the Italian king of Sardinia and Piedmont. Otto relocates the capital of the city. The relocation of the royal, yes, the royal seat from Nafnum to Athens was completed in early December 1834. The establishment of the new capital at the place where ancient democracy and its political and cultural achievements were developed legitimized the connection between modern Greeks and the most alluring aspects of ancient Greek, Greece in the eyes of the Europeans. These connections remained an ideal of the state who often pushed the residents of the new capital to follow this symbolic trajectory, although it often meant more to the West than it did to Athenians. In this sense, Athens served as a Western experiment aimed primarily at showcasing Greece's ancient past through the excavation of ancient cities and monuments. The city was reorganized fully following newly created avenues and roads and new buildings followed the neoclassical style, which was then predominant in Europe. This campaign across archaeology, urban planning and architecture gradually shaped the modern Greek identity of the city and connected antiquity and antiquity to the lives of its residents. The 1862 revolution and the deposition of King Otto upset the political balance in Greece and suddenly groups of Greek politicians who had no experience the war of independence were thrust into leading government roles. The solution to the problem of selecting a new ruler for the Kingdom of Greece was provided by the British Minister of Foreign Affairs, 
who nominated Prince Christian William George, second son of the heir to the throne of Denmark. A referendum organized by the Greek government had, had already taken place, whereby the nomination of British Prince Alfred, second son of Queen Victoria, had gathered 94%. In September 1863, the Ionian Parliament voted for unification with Greece, meaning the start of King George I's reign, together with the territorial expansion of the country. Following the resolution of the Second General Assembly, a three-member committee traveled to Copenhagen to offer the crown to the new king in the name of the Greek nation. The resolution appointed George as the constitutional king of the Hellenes, a fact that greatly troubled the Supreme Court, as the term included the Greeks outside the country's border. Costume and set designer and collector Dionysis Fotopoulos is a dedicated researcher of the history of border Greeks, Greek dress. Encompassing both small and large items, his private collection covers all historical periods and all landmarks of Greek dress from the pre-revolutionary period until well into the 20th century. This includes works by known and unknown artists, bourgeois and popular paintings, sculptures in marble and wood, and utilitarian metal containers and small tobacco boxes. Through the porters, portraits of fighters of the war, public officials, officers, priests, diaspora Greeks, ladies of Athenian society and wealthy families, the public role of this garment worn by modern Greeks is revealed. Such representations convey the public prestige carried by each dress, along with the atmosphere of its era and of the period of the transition. The premiership of Harila Ostrikoupis marked the first concert, concerted efforts to carry out the major public works in Greece, which the country surely needed. Greece engineers and public office planned these works in collaboration with foreign engineers, mostly from France, focusing particularly on the creation of a road and railway ro uh, network, as well, as well as port facilities. Three additional projects epitomize the efforts of the era in both technical and economical terms. The bridging of Evripo Strait, the draining of Lake Copais, and of course, the opening of the Corinth Canal. The opening of the, opening of the Corinth Canal in 1893, in particular, marked the happy <laughs> conclusion of an engineering vision that had been conveyed in antiquity more than 2,000 years before. The 1893 inauguration of the canal was marked by a celebration captured in three paintings by Konstantinos Volanakis, which belong to the collection of the three th banking institutions that organized the exhibition in partnership with the Benaki Museum. The Greek War of Independence seems to be a constant source of inspiration for 20th and early 24th, 21st century Greek artists. The representation of scenes and heroes of the war is a testament to the fact that the echo of that national effort remains as strong as ever and its charm is very much alive in contemporary society. The portraits of the protagonists of the war in popular bourgeois and modern art keeps alive the connection with the beginnings of modern Greece. The connection is evidently much needed both by artists and viewers since the faces of heroes of the struggle have provided inspiration during many hard and desperate times such as the years of the Axis occupation, occupation of Greece between 1941 and 1944. Furthermore, in the post-war years when the bond between contemporary Greek identity and its roots and moral constitution came under strain, these same, these same faces were viewed and depicted differently. Greece adopted as its national anthem the first stanzas of Hymn to Liberty by Dionysius Solomon, a poem of exceptional sensitivity and quality. This ode to the struggle of freedom was written in Zakynthos in 1823 and was printed and distributed in revolutionary held mesology in 1823. Thank you both. Um, 
I, I think, to be honest, I, I think showing, I, I, I know it's a work in progress hybrid, but I, I think it better reflects um, the exhibit. And obviously the next obviously step would be to come to the Monaki and, and see the exhibit <laughs> firsthand and spend time there. But, but certainly I think versus just showing photographs and talking over photographs, I think, I think it was, uh, I think it shows the, uh, uh, it flows well. Uh, but it also, I think shows the, um, the, the colors. Well, it shows the, the depth of the exhibit. And I think that's it's something totally different from a PowerPoint. It's totally different yes. from a PowerPoint. Absolutely, absolutely. So, first question: um, the exhibit um, is is the entire exhibit located at the Banaki? I know you mentioned the ground Imperial, floor. Is it building? Three okay. floors. Three floors. And where is that? And for our audience, where is that located? It's because near Omonia. It's about uh, okay. a quarter of an hour from Omonia from square. Square. Omonia square. Okay. Perfect. And and the exhibit, how the exhibit obviously is open now. How long do you expect to have it? Uh, Until uh, the beginning of November. Till November. At the Wonderful. beginning of November. Beginning of November. Okay. And then hopefully beyond that, you can take it or take part of it to different places across the world, possibly. Is that an option? We hope. <laughs> we hope of that you can see it in the US too. Of course. Uh, another question is with regards to the, um, I mean, you showed us certainly a lot of different um, paintings, artifacts uh, as part of the exhibit. Um, and a lot of it you mentioned, uh, some of it came from the, the banks that are sponsoring. Can you give us a sense of how much was, was already at the Banaki uh, in your collection and how much came from outside? It's about 90, 92, 93% from Banaki Museum, and the other 7% from the other collectors and the banks. And, you know, obviously we all know, for, especially here in the diaspora, the, 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 we've learned through the years and through our history, the important role of the, of the Philhellenes during the revolution, before, during, and after as well. And I think you obviously you've reflected that. Um, yes. when, w in terms of the artifacts and the paintings you have, what are some of the, maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the, the earliest uh, pieces uh, that, that highlight the work of uh, Philhellenes. And, and maybe where they came from. Were they at the Banaki already or were, were they coming from private exhibits? Uh, no, the most um, items that we have regarding the Philhellenes are from the Banaki's collection and they are uh, oil paintings or uh, even um, mm -hmm. shorts or, uh, or uh, paper as books or uh, uh, this kind of things. And we also have um, items that uh, they were um, uh, sold in Europe in order to support the Greek uh, War of Independence. So this, uh, all these items, especially these items, uh, were sold in uh, Switzerland. There was a big... Uh, a kind of fundraising for the Greek... It was an auction. And uh, all the profits uh, went for uh, the Greek War of Independence in order to buy guns and powder and uh, these kind of things. So uh, these kind of items are uh, presented in the, in the part that we are referring to Philhellenism and how, it, the, uh, this, uh, how Philhellenism was uh, depicted in uh, oil paintings and how it was uh, shown outside Greece. What would you say is um, another question? Some of the more, I guess, I know you went through a lot of them. You highlighted some of the more significant pieces, not necessarily in value, but in terms of, of uh, you know, being sort of the, the highlight or the cornerstone of the exhibit. About the, the whole exhibition or about the yes, the whole, whole exhibition. I think that one of, one of the most valuable things, but it was, um, it's, it's a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper. It's a piece of paper. It's a manuscript. The date is February 1822. It's uh, the Greek uh, revolutionary government decides that uh, to, abandon, to, for, to prohibit slavery. And no man, um, men or women, uh, uh, color or religion should be sold in any way in uh, in the in the revolutionary Greek state. This is very innovating, and it, it is uh, even before uh, England. 
uh, stops the slavery. It shows uh, the democracy, the, the spirit of uh, democracy and the, um, the willing of uh, the Greeks to form uh, a modern state. That in a modern state, no slavery has to do has nothing to do there is, this, no is a, this is an article of the evolutionary constitution but we have an exhibition at the prototype the piece of paper with the fame of the minister of the revolution and, and we think that this is a very very important collection important item it's a uh, proof. i'd have to uh, of course, but I, I would have to say, given the, you know the 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 obviously the, the the modern history of the United States and uh, particularly around slavery, um, you know what one of the things we've learned, especially during this 200th anniversary, is what the 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 uh, it, it's one thing being back in the 1800s and there's no internet, there's no technology, there's no news, uh, so you relied on the eyes and ears of the person that was there. And certainly the, the many Philhellenes that, that were over in Greece in the Mediterranean fighting came back and, and their eyes were open widely to what they saw uh, in terms of the, the war, the atrocities, everything that was happening. And, you know, we've tried to highlight this through some of our earlier uh, NHS talk stories with regards to the, the, not just the influence, but also the influence Greece had, the, the creation of the modern Greek state had with with the United States as it related to ending slavery, uh, bringing, bringing in into introduction of women's rights. And a lot of that started uh, because of what was seen and heard during the war and, and post-war. So I think that's, a, that's probably a very critical document, uh, one that uh, we probably here in the States that we've probably taken for granted, especially <laughs> the impact, the impact yes, that it's made. <laughs> You know, but we've again we've learned, and I hate to say this. I think it's embarrassing for some of us as Greek Americans. I'm second generation. We grew up learning about the revolution. We heard about, you know, through our own families the history, but we've learned so much just in this year because of the number yeah. of presentations and lectures and exhibits um, that that we we've, po we've hosted. Uh, that we've there's a lot unfortunately we don't know and it, it, I think it's for, as for us again that are of Greek descent it's I think it's somewhat you, embarrassing that we're not very, aware very, of these things very interesting and very crucial is the political activity during the revolution yes. and this is a very strong part of the revolution it's not only the Absolutely. war not only the guns and not only the paintings we try to present the political way of the revolution and right. the connection right. between the Greeks and the European right it was Absolutely. a kind of Greek exams to the Europeans for yeah. the presentation we, we, of we a modern a, state. Exactly, right. And as well as the influences, we also did, we hosted an event um, a few months back regarding, and of course, uh, I'm here in Boston, the, the influences of, of the, the Boston uh, politicians and the major uh, stakeholders here in Boston behind the scenes influencing the Greek government not to get in, excuse me, in, influence the United States government not to get involved in the war, to be peacekeepers, uh, because of the trade, behind the scenes trade they had of Turk, Turkish opium to China. So you learn about these things and you begin to put all these pieces together. And I think it's it's wonderful that, that a, 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 you know, such a, a, a wonderful place like the Banaki uh, illustrates that and shows not, the, the influences the, of that. It's not only the heroic war part of the revolution. It's the institutional part as well. Right. And the Bismarck archives, they have a lot of items about this mm -hmm. way of fighting. Sure. The other way of fighting. This is very and unfortunately, Right. And unfortunately, too, uh, you know, what, what we, uh, there's only so much history you can learn, right, in a, in a classroom. Um, you know, we hear about wars and, and certain events over time and when the war is over you know we move on to the next historical event exactly. but what we forget is just because the war is over doesn't mean everything is perfect everything is exactly. back to back to you know back to where the people wanted you know as we know from the history of greece there was a lot of it was a difficult time there was a lot of change in in uh in government there was change in people's attitudes there was internal strife but and but so, you know, the, these, are, these are things that really help shape the, com the, the country it is, it is and very, have influenced the country until today. It is very interesting and crucial that we have a state born from a revolution. Right. 
This is very interesting for the Greek people. And the identity, our identity is the Greek Revolution. Thank you all, and uh, you know, thank my colleagues. Uh, under the guidance of the uh, president of the Banaki Museum, Irene Gerulan, and the guidance of the Board of uh, Trustees, the leadership of the academic director, George McGinnis, but most important, the work our colleagues at the Historical Archives have done. We have an amazing presentation that today we wanted to share with you, almost you know, physically in a way, uh, with the support of uh, Faliron House, we have this uh, 360 video that you know, will be available. And very soon, we will have for the uh, Greek uh, communities here in Greece and also the Hellenic diaspora across the, uh, the globe, the augmented reality application uh, that takes uh, very uh, specific artifacts of the uh, uh, exhibition and uh, altogether gives a comprehensive um, understanding of the exhibition itself and, you know, the uh, bicentennial, the anniversary. Uh, and uh, it is on this occasion that I would like to thank you personally, uh, Drake, because a few years ago when we started the fundraising to develop this application, you were among the first to uh, chip in and, uh, you know, um, help us. So um, uh, in about a month from uh, now, when, the exhibition, when this application will be uh, available, uh, we would like to celebrate it again with you and the National Hellenic Society and share this uh, augmented reality application. Now, uh, to the question that you had about the, the artifacts, I would like to contribute, if you want, not as a historian, uh, or not even as a member of the Benaki team, if you want, but as a viewer of the exhibition. There is a flag of uh, General Kolokotronis that uh, he took uh, with him when he was trying to convince the uh, islanders of Zakynthos to join the revolution. Uh, it, it's a beautiful artifact that you can see um, in the exhibition and the catalog, and has an Athena grabbing the, uh, uh, the sword of the evil Turk and the all-seeing eye that reminds a lot of the, either the eye at the uh, uh, holy seat of the Patriarchate or the eye that you have on the dollar sign. Um, and, uh, but the most important artifact, and that's a story that I heard for the first time from uh, Tassos and Maria, is that he took them this uh, flag that had a lot of stains, a lot of blood stains, Basically, he told them, listen, I want you to come and help the revolution. I know you're well off here, you know, under the, uh, um, that's the flag, yeah. Uh, thank you, George. Uh, I know you're, you know, pretty well off here, you know, under the, uh, the rule of the, the British at that time, right, uh, Tassos? Uh, well, the medical but, doctor, the yeah. leader of the Zakynthian to the Greek revolution, Dragon. And, and he goes to, uh, to them, listen, I bring you the blood of your brothers. And this artifact has, you know, at least to me as a viewer of this exhibition, particular sentimental value, because when we're talking about, uh, you know, a revolution and, you know, through history books, etc., we don't get to realize the blood that was literally shed and, you know, the kind of sacrifice that it took for us to have a nation and a statehood. So um, it, it is a very sentimental artifact. And then to the Greek-American connection, I'm, and I'm, I'm closing with that, uh, when I was um, a student in the States, I was very, very proud that uh, one, an orphan of the uh, Greek War of Independence was adopted by a family of industrialists in uh, New York. Uh, he became uh, very wealthy, you know, he inherited the wealth from his family. Uh, he had forgotten where he came from, and uh, at the end of his life, he created a school for in New York for the underprivileged with no tuition. It is the Cooper Union. Uh, Peter Cooper, I think his first name was Peter. Uh, Peter Cooper, who created Cooper Union in New York City, was an orphan taken from, you know, by a family of Americans from the Greek Revolution and went on. And to me, it's, it's, it's a very epic episode in this, you know, connection between uh, the history of the Greek diaspora, the war of independence. It's a beautiful story that, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have any particular value, but it does have to me a lot. So uh, these, you know, small episodes uh, is what brings us, you know, uh, together, uh, both the Greeks of uh, mainland Greece and the, uh, the Greeks of diaspora in celebrating this uh, uh, wonderful event. So thank you for that. We try, thank you, Nico. We try to present all the steps about the Greek symbols and all the symbols that create our national identity. It was very interesting for us 
to have a presentation for the steps of the Greek symbols and for the steps for the creation of a modern state. This is our goal. And I think we did well. <laughs> I think you did very well. Excellent. Uh, and I think one of the, 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 the major, <clears throat> especially for us as we, we, we go through the various generations here <clears throat> in the United States, um, you know, the educational aspect is, is significant, as you know, uh, keeping our families and our children and their children engaged and learning about the history and certainly uh, what you're offering, both not only live in person, but also through, through, the, through the technology and certainly when the augmented reality uh, application comes out. These are great, again, great opportunities for, for obviously not only uh, Greeks, but Greeks from abroad from the various uh, homogenia that can certainly help promote and, and help bring those down to their families and, and to the, into the various educational institutions as well. So we thank you for that. And we look forward to that and work thank and continue our collaboration. Our colleagues as well. <clears throat> Absolutely, thank you, thank you. So I wanna personally thank you as we wrap up. Uh, Nico, Yorgo, uh, Maria Tasso, thank you very much, uh, you very much. For, for a wonderful Good presentation. And hopefully, uh, and of course, you, we always have an open uh, invitation for you here in the States whenever you do visit. Uh, we'd love to collaborate again, but also more importantly to our audience, to our family and to our friends that are either in Greece now or traveling to Greece this summer or in the fall. Uh, please try and make it a point to, to go to the Banaki Museum and certainly we can help facilitate an introduction uh, to anyone on this call or if you want to get a special tour or anything like that. So we thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes.